today, the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. We'll be here again in Denver. And the epistle for this fifth Sunday after Pentecost is taken from Saint First Epistle of Saint Peter, chapter three. Dearly beloved, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, being lovers of the brotherhood, merciful, modest, humble, not rendering evil for evil, nor railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. For unto this are you called, that you may inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they may they speak no God. Let them decline from evil and do good. Let them seek after peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are upon the just, and his ears unto their prayers. But the countenance of the Lord upon them that do evil things. And who is he that can hurt you, if you be zealous for good? But if also you suffer anything for justice' sake, blessed are ye. And do not be afraid of their fear, and be not troubled, but sanctify the Lord your Christ in, in your hearts. And the gospel, and then according to St. Matthew chapter 5. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Except your justice abound more than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to them of old, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. If therefore thou offer thy gift at the altar, and there thou remember that thy brother hath anything against thee, have the, leave there thy offering before the altar, and go first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then coming thou shalt offer thy gift. Those are the words of today's Lord of God. Amen. Today, a few considerations on one of the 11 passions that we have to deal with and uh, that God gave to us. God created man with the soul and body and the 11 passions. And one of the passions has no opposite. There are five positive passions which are responded by five negative passions, but one passion has no opposite, and it is the passion of anger. And it's our 11 passions and not 12. And the two considerations on that passion taken in prim primarily from the consideration of sacred scripture today and, the, and, and uh, from the commentary of St. Augustine. Because it says in the sacred scripture today, we read in the bravery on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost about David. On the few days after Saul died. And St. Jerome the Augustine gives a commentary on this reaction of David a few days after the death of Saul. And the reaction of Jeremiah the prophet, when he also had a great trouble. And he mentions how Jeremiah the prophet, he was preaching to the Jewish people about God. He was preaching the truth to them. He was preaching to them about our Lord and about the faith they must follow. And they did not listen to him. And they would not listen to him. And Jeremiah did not become angry. Jeremiah was filled with a great sadness and a great sorrow. And he said, Lord, don't let me continue. And he felt with a feeling of exceeding great sorrow because he had failed in his mission. And yet, he was teaching the holy truth. He was the prophet of God. He was speaking to the people of God, and the people of God were rejecting him. The people of God were not listening. Therefore, says St. Augustine, should he not be angry? And yet, he is not angry. He goes into sorrow instead. Then we come to the situation of David in the, in the, in the sacred scripture reading today from the book of Kings. Saul died in battle, and three days later, an Ahimelechite came with red garments and ashes on his head, and he came before David, and he said, There was a battle three days ago, and Saul and Jonathan, his son, and his other sons were killed in the battle. And then and, and David said, How do you know he died? How do you know that Saul died? He said, Because I was passing through the battlefield when the battle was over, and I saw Saul that he was wounded and he fell upon his own spear to kill himself. But he was still so very strong that he was still alive. And therefore Saul said to me, Take your sword and kill me, that I not go so long to death. 
And therefore I obeyed him, and I killed Saul. And I took the diadem off his head of the crown of the king, and I took the bracelet off his arm, and I bring it to you. And then the scripture tells us, And David wept. And David rent his garments, and David mourned. For Saul was dead. And when David wept and rent his garments, all the men around him also wept and rent their garments. And they also mourned the death of Saul. And then immediately after he had wept and rent his garments, he then turned upon the Amalekite and he said, Who are you? I am an Amalekite, the son of Amalek. As you should know as an Amalekite, that you are, why did you lift your hand to touch the anointed of God? For Saul is the anointed of God. And how dare you lift your hand to touch the anointed? And he was filled with great anger. And he commanded one of the soldiers, and he immediately said, Fall upon him and kill him. And he sent one of his soldiers, David, one of his soldiers, and immediately killed the Amalekite. Note here the reaction of David. What did David do? David heard that Saul was dead. Now we must remember the course of the situation about Saul. King Saul was, of course, a king anointed by God. That Saul was displeasing. Saul was displeasing to God because of many, many sins that he committed. Therefore God said, I will make a new king. And Samuel, who had anointed Saul, came and anointed David as a young boy. And this is many years later. And Saul, he was anointed to be the king to replace Saul. And David knew he would be the king to replace Saul. He also knew that God was displeased with Saul. And then David went and lived with Saul. And Saul would try to kill him multiple times. Saul would, just, Saul would be happy with David, but then he heard them sing the song, which we read every day in the breviary during this period. We read about every day in the breviary as our antiphon. We read, Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his ten thousands. And all the women sang about Saul killing thousands, but David ten thousands. And when the song came to Saul, he was extremely angry and extremely envious of David, and therefore he tried to kill him multiple times. And then David had to flee, and then David came back, and Saul repented, and then Saul tried to kill him again, and David had to flee, and then, then Saul repented, and he came back again, and then Saul changed his mind and tried to kill him again. One time when Saul, when David was playing the harp, and playing music because he was a very great musician, and, and, and David and Saul liked to hear David singing, one time while he was singing, Saul picked up a spear and tried to kill him while he was singing. And Saul, David, had to run away. This is the Saul whom David wept for. And so when Saul died, David wept. Then he had anger. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that, that this anger is one of the eleven passions. It is a kind of glue between the soul and the body. And anger is not ever directly controlled. None of the 11 passions are directly controlled. We can only control them indirectly. So, for instance, we all say, why are you angry? Well, because my husband was killed. Well, it can happen, for instance, that it might happen one day that a husband is killed. And you come and reform the wife, and she is very happy. Because he beat her every day. He took out a $100,000 life and policy yesterday. You had planned his murder this afternoon, and you're going to move in with your new boyfriend and marry him next week. And your husband died. There's joy in the heart. Now, why is there joy in the heart? The husband died. Another husband dies. He forgot to take out the $100,000 policy. You actually like him. And you don't like the guy that killed him. The word comes, your husband is dead, and you are filled with sorrow and anger. Note this concerning the passions. The death of husbands, the murder of popes, the attack of yourself, have nothing to do with the passion of anger or of sadness or of joy. What we make choices before the day the husband's killed. You make choices before the day a husband is killed. You have something in your heart the day before the husband is killed. And then when the husband is killed, whatever is in the heart comes out through the passions. So the passions are a kind of a litmus test. What is in your heart? What is already in your heart? Remember that David had many reasons to hate Saul, and many reasons to be very happy that Saul was dead, and everyone knew it. Therefore the Amalekite came and would prove that Saul was dead, and he even obeyed Saul to kill him. But what was the heart of David? 
David loved Saul, even though Saul hated David. And David also had a special respect for Saul, only because, and especially because, and primarily because, he was the anointed of God. And therefore, whoever touches the anointed of God, he was filled with wrath. His passion he cannot control. We do not directly control our passions. We control what is in our heart before the passion is aroused, and then we control the reaction to the passion afterwards. So the husband was killed. Of course the wife was mad. Well, maybe not. Maybe the wife isn't so mad at all that the husband was killed. Maybe the wife is happy that the husband is killed. Maybe the wife is, is, is unhappy the husband is killed. And either way does not depend in any way upon the murderer that killed the husband. It depends completely upon what is already in the height, heart of the wife before the husband dies. And hence, when we look at our angers and our sadness and the movements of our passions, they are little tests. What is in my heart right now? What is in it? St. Thomas also tells us there are 11 passions, but 10 of them are following passions, and one of them is a leading passion, and that is the passion of love. Love determines the other 10 passions. What we love is a passion. It's not only an intellectual thing. It falls into our heart. It's a passion. Consider the love, the deep love of, of, of St. Lawrence. Lawrence had a deep love of Christ, and he had a deep love to follow Christ to martyrdom. He had a deep love to, be, to receive the glory of martyrdom. And therefore, what happened when they burned him on a gridiron? He was very happy. He could not choose to be joyful. He couldn't choose it. There was once a wicked woman in, in, uh, in, in Spain who, uh, who was possessed of the devil and tried to pretend as though she was a saint. <clears throat> And therefore, she offered up, she acts like she smiled in sufferings, and then eventually they found out that this lady is of the devil and not of God. And when they analyzed her, they realized they had, eventually they got her, and before she uh, had tried to, get to find out what her life was like, did you hurt? What did you feel when you got pain? I felt very angry. I felt very sad, very upset, but I knew they all thought I was a saint, so I smiled. <laughs> I smiled on the outside, and when they analyzed, you know, right, she did smile, but the smile didn't seem correct. It did not seem genuine, now that we look back over it. And she knew that when she would have false ecstasies, they tested by putting a pin and poking her arm. And she knew that if you have a real ecstasy, you can't feel the poke of a pin. And she said it hurt every time, and I wanted to kill the one with a pin. But I knew that I could not flinch. And if you'll notice, when you look, even though I didn't arm, you saw, you, I didn't move, you saw tension in my arm. And they noticed, when they back, that she did not react in, in by joy in the midst of pain. But what about St. Lawrence? Lawrence wanted to be a martyr. Lawrence wanted to love God. Lawrence wanted to experience the suffering of martyrdom. And when he found out he was being martyred, he was filled with such great joy. The joy was a natural consequence of the love that was in his heart. We find this time and time again in the life of the martyrs. And the love made him experience joy, which is one of the 11 passions. Love also makes us experience sadness when our love is attacked. What is our love? And then anger. Anger also is guided by love. Anger is the passion that makes us overcome obstacles or strive to overcome obstacles. We become very angry. Now, what is the obstacle? St. Augustine talks about these obstacles. He says, now consider David. When Saul was removed, the obstacle to his kingship was removed. The one that threatened his life was removed. But he did not care about such a removal. Had he cared about that removal, he would have been very joyful and he would have, he would have praised the Amalekite and given him a, a position in his kingdom. But his joy was not in that. His love was not in his kingship. His love was not in his position that he was chosen by God. His love was for God. And his love was for the law of God. And one of the very important signs is that he would not allow that the anointing of God, who was the head of the Holy Church, named Saul the King, that he should be attacked. No one could lay a hand upon him. Now Saul had to flee him. Saul had to, I mean, David had to flee Saul. David had to disobey Saul. David had even to fight against Saul to a certain extent. But he did, would not lay hands upon Saul. He wouldn't do it because he's the anointing of God. In our present situation, we can apply this very easily to Pope Francis. Pope Francis is the anointed of God. There should not be anger in our hearts towards him. There should not be violence towards him. He is the anointed of God. We may have to fight against him. 
We may have to flee him. We may have to combat him in, in, in multiple ways in order to preserve our holy faith. But there cannot be an anger inside of the heart. And, there, and that this anger inside of the heart is not of God. So we're going to consider what is in the heart. It is based upon our loves. So that there is anger when be angry and sin not. It says in sacred scripture, be angry and sin not. So a man tempts you to sin. There's a temptation to sin. An example of this, for instance, is St. Thomas Aquinas, the most gentle of all saints. As he was in his room at the age of 16 years old, and a girl was sent in, a prostitute was sent to his room, in order to tempt him to sin. And the most gentle of young men, what did he do? He pulled a firebrand out of the fireplace, and he attacked her and tried to kill her. Be angry and sin not. Why? Because he was going to overcome the temptation. You don't be nice to a one who is attempting you to impurity. You flee and you fight. And so he attacked, and then the temptations of the flesh were taken from him for the remainder of his days. Be angry and sin not. Now you can only be angry and sin not if there is a love of God actually inside the heart. The love of God must be in the center of my heart. And what do I get angry about? One of the rules of St. Ben of Bonaventure says, there is such a thing as sinful memory. He talks about sinful memory. He says, what do we remember? We remember when someone slights us. We remember when someone offends us. We remember very well. And why is that? Because my dignity and my heart are very important to me. And when you attack my heart and my dignity, that makes me very angry. And therefore, the anger is not of God. Very often also, we are angry about things that we even should be angry about. Or that it's right to be angry about. But we're angry because of the wrong reasons. Why are we angry that they become modernists in the society of St. Pius X? We don't care about the Trinity of St. Peter being modernists. We don't care about the local diocese being modernists. We don't care about the people in China being modernists. But we care very much about the SSPX being modernists and that we can't go to their masses. Why? Because of that stinking modernism inside the society of St. Pius X, I can't go to Mass. And that really ticks me off. Now, why am I angry? Because my supernatural comfort has been affected. Even though it's supposed to be a holy anger to be angry about heresy and to be angry about going away from God. We will discover often that even when there is a so-called holy anger, parents, for instance, really angry because their kids disturbed their plans. I mean, because their kids did something wrong. <laughs> now, the fact is... That what is the reason for the anger? You're supposed to be angry with kids when they do something wrong. You're supposed to spank them when they do something wrong. But very often the anger is mixed. It is partly because they did something wrong and partly because they need to be corrected. But more importantly because we have been affected. So very often even when we're angry about the things we are supposed to be angry about, we are angry for the wrong reasons. Our Lord Jesus Christ became angry in his life. He became angry with St. Peter. He became angry at the Pharisees and Sadducees. He manifested his anger from time to time. It is a rare thing, but he did it. Anger is a passion given to us by God, which is to be used. And what governs this passion? Love. Whatever a love is inside of us, that love that is really inside of us, this is the love that excites anger. That's why very often, when someone does something contrary to God's law, that our anger has to be worked up. But when somebody does something against us, our anger does not have to be worked up. We used as an example earlier about many souls very angry at Pope Francis. Extremely angry at Pope Francis because he allowed the divorce and remarried to receive Holy Communion. And this is a terrible scandal. This has gone too far. Vatican II has gone too far. This is absolutely terrible. It is terrible. But is communion in the hand worse? Yes, it is. Mm. Is receive, giving communion to a non-Catholic worse? Yes, it is. Is the Cubanism worse? Yes, it is. You didn't get all worked up about Cubanism. You didn't get all worked up about communion in the hand. You didn't get all worked up about these other great sacrileges that are directly against God. When God's anointed is, is attacked, you are not so upset. But when your wife and your husband and your, 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 your friends are able to go to communion now, it makes you extremely angry. This anger is not of God. Very often, anger, even about right things, is not of God. 
Which is why, for instance, our Lord said to the James and John, destroy the city of Corazon, send fire from heaven. And our Lord said, you don't know the spirit that moves you. You're angry because you went there to preach the gospel and they didn't listen. And you want them to have justice. Therefore, you are angry because you are offended. You are angry of the wrong spirit. Corazon should have listened to you. They did not. You are angry. Are you angry because they did not listen to my words? Are you angry because they are not following God? Or are you angry because they didn't follow you and you are leading them to God? Hence, we go back to Jeremiah. St. Augustine goes back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet of God. Jeremiah is speaking with the mouth of God with the prophecy of God, and he is telling the people to repent, and they don't repent. They don't listen to Jeremiah. They did listen to Jonas, but they won't listen to Jeremiah. And very often, the prophets of God who speak the divine truth will not be listened to. What is the response to the prophets of God? Jeremiah became sorrowful and not angry. What did he see? Lord, I have failed. He saw his own failure. He, would not, he did not become angry with them, but rather he wept that they might repent. So there is a time of weeping and there is a time of anger. Now which time is which? We only know if the correct love is that which guides us. So we get angry when the coffee isn't cold. Or the coffee is hot, not cold. It's one of those cold country things again. <laughs> you get angry when the coffee is cold. You get angry in the traffic jam. You get angry if people don't get it. Now, when you didn't get it, there was no reason to be angry. But when you get it and they don't, this is ridiculous. <laughs> many, many women have had, I, it makes me so angry if I can't count the number of women. I cannot tell you how angry I am when I see how impure these young girls are. How angry I am when I see how badly they dress. Because I know I did that when I was young. So then why are you angry? <laughs> why are you angry then? You weren't angry when you were being impure. You weren't angry when you were young. But now you're angry when they are. You know what it's called? Jealousy. You're angry because they ain't looking at you. They're looking at them. <laughs> it's not that complicated. But the real reason is I know how impure they are. That all sounds beautiful. That sounds so righteous. That sounds so just. Be angry and sin not. What is the anger? When we see that others are dressed badly, we see others are behaving badly, sometimes it's the right thing to yell at them because that's what's required to convert their souls. Sometimes it's necessary to be kind to them. Sometimes it's necessary to say nothing. Love motivates. As St. Teresa of Avila says, love has many languages. Love is sometimes violent, and love is sometimes too lenient. When love is cruel, and love is gentle, and love speaks, and love is silent. And love has all different opposite manifestations. And St. Teresa says, and if one is missing, the whole of love falls apart. Those who love and are always angry, they do not love. Those who love and are always mushy, they do not love. Mm. Love must have all the sides. Now, the test of love is, what causes me to be mushy? What causes me to be joyful? What causes me to be angry? Let us go to the root of the cause. We remove the cause and the anger will be less. The devil will always try to tempt us. But let us face the cause. What do I love? We all say we love God. We all say we love the truth. But when God is attacked, we don't get that upset. We don't get that hurt. But when I am attacked, when I am assaulted, it bothers me very much. And this is a problem about love. Anger is a passion we must face. Consider the holy anger of David. Notice, first he wept because Saul was dead. Then he became angry because Amalek murdered Saul. Note the order of his passion. First he wept because Saul was dead. And then he became angry at Amalek, and then he killed Amalek, the Amalekite. And so this is the order. Love has to be the first motion. And that what is the first motion? It happens so often that when something that is attacked, we, don't, we, we respond in the wrong way. Our Lord has allowed us to have a wicked pope. He's allowed us to have wicked bishops. Do we deserve good ones? No, we don't. Therefore, we should not be so shocked. 
We should weep because God is offended. We should be angry sometimes because God is offended. But what should motivate that anger, that weeping, and that joy that we experience in life? It is the love of God. What was this part of Jesus Christ when he walked away at the cross? He had joy deeply in his heart because he was going after his beloved to conquer. He was going after his beloved to bring the soul to heaven. He was fulfilling the will of his Father. There was an excitement of love and an excitement of joy in the deepest heart of the man of sorrows as he walked away of the cross. And then what does it tell us also at the beginning of the Gospel of St. John? And the people believed in him, and the people honored him. The very beginning of the Gospel of St. John. But he did not put his confidence in them, for he knew it was in the heart of man. When they were crucifying him, he had joy in his inner heart. When they were praising him, he did not. As Bishop Sheen says, the journey of the priesthood, the journey of his priesthood. In the very beginning, he's a newly ordained. So someone praises him. He goes, yeah, you're right. That's pretty good. I'm really good. Later on, he has a further system. Phase one, sorry, wrong, it's phase two. Phase one is embarrassment because you're supposed to be spiritual. Phase one, someone praises you and you get upset because you're supposed to be spiritual. I'm not supposed to be upset. Phase one. Phase two, you know what? You're right. Phase two is to enjoy the praise. And then there's phase three. It says phase three is a skeptical phase. I am praising you. What do you want? <laughs> like when a husband brings home flowers, what does he want? <laughs> a husband's being nice all of a sudden, what does he want? <laughs> there are three phases. Now the fact is that we must consider what is it that motivates us. Anger is a passion that we experience. Sometimes anger arises when it should not. Why? Because we don't love right. Because we, our loves are not directed in the right way. We are not attentive to God. We are not attentive to the neighbor. We are not anxious for the neighbor. But we are anxious for ourselves. What does St. Paul says? Who is not attacked that I am not on fire? He had, no, I have the care of all the churches. He has the care of all the churches in his heart. But he didn't care about the fact that he was swimming in the ocean. He was swimming in the ocean about to drown. What was he worried about? There's a hundred other people in this ocean. Lord, don't let them drown. And they all lived the next morning, and he was alive also. But he didn't care about himself being alive through that sea, a night and a day of the sea. He cared only about them. What motivates our heart? And this will determine our joys and our sorrows and our anger. And we're in an age now where man is governed by a wrong love. Let us make sure the divine love inside, inside of us, the true love of the faith, the love of the truth, the love of God, the love of his justice, the love of the first commandments, the first table of the law, over the love of the second table of the law, the obligations towards God versus the obligations towards man, towards the neighbor. And then these loves will control and guide our anger and guide our joy and guide our sadness, sadness, so that we respond in the right way. Closing the close of the day, God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.